important to me that you know that up until about 10 minutes ago, I was wearing the same shirt I've been wearing for three days and I only changed out of it to film this video. Booktubers, we're just like you. Hello Bibliophiles, my name is Jill and I'm here to review my first book of 2021. I, for some reason, I was really, really adamant that the first book I read in 2021 had to be The Eighth Life by Nino Chili, translated from the German by uh, Charlotte Collins and Ruth Martin, two translators. And um, I don't know why I was so like, oh my God, it has to be this book. And uh, there's no reason other than I just decided I wanted to read a long, like girthy book <laughs> to start the year off. Um, this book, I'll, you know, no tea, no shade to start off, but I didn't love it. Um, and I'm I'm upset about it. <laughs> so if you don't know what this book is, this book was um, shortlisted for the Booker International in 2020, which is how I first heard about it. And when I saw that there was like this close to 1000 page tome of like this multi-generational family saga set in Soviet Georgia and kind of over um, Europe writ large over a century, it was like, yeah, Obviously, I'm going to read that. <laughs> like, that ticks a lot of my boxes. So I picked it up on my e-reader because, uh, quite frankly, I don't have room for 1,000 page books on my shelves. Also, I don't like read- like, this is just a total aside, but I don't really like reading big- like, holding physically big books because I find them, like, hard to get comfortable with. Like, I can't lie down on my bed, I can't really sit comfortably on the couch. So I got it on my e-reader also because it was like $40 cheaper on my e-reader than it was to buy it a hard copy. Guys, what is with the cost of books? They are extortionate. I don't understand how they can, like I, I guess as a pandemic, is that why they're gone up? But like $41 for a paperback book, no. Anyway, let's just get into this review. I didn't love this book. And I think this book is like, let's just say that this book is fine. And you know, if that, if I was saying this about uh, a 300 page novel, I would not be bothered by that. But because this book is nearly a thousand pages, no 1000 page book should be fine. It should be excellent, <laughs> or at least very good. Uh, let's see if I can contextualize why it's so upsetting that this book is just okay for me. Um, other than I spent like 30 hours reading this book. <laughs> and you're asking, why didn't, why'd you finish it? I'll get into that in a second. As I mentioned, this is a multi-generational family saga. Um, it's called The Eighth Life because it follows specifically uh, eight characters. The idea, the concept of um, eight is the idea that it's an infinite, it, it, if you turn it aside, it's infinity. You know, it's a, a life that is endless, that has endless possibilities to it. Um, and so there is, of course, like a theme to that. I think the most um, disappointing thing about this book is that it never really, for, for me, it never culminated in anything. So, you know, this book is addressing at the beginning some, or even throughout, like there's different themes that come up throughout the book that you feel like, oh, that's a really interesting idea. And I'm really curious to see where that goes or like, what's she gonna do with that particular um, nugget of information? Or like, how is this character gonna connect to this character? And it just, it never resolves in a way for me that is worth the time that you put into it. Um, so at the beginning of the book, we begin in like the um, early 1900s at the October Revolution. Actually, let's start with the narrator. The narrator is a woman called Niza. She is uh, the second to last generation in this family. And she is narrating her entire life story to Brilka. So the subtitle of this book is called For Brilka. And uh, Brilka is her niece. And we find out that toward the end of the book, why she is narrating this story for, for her niece. Um, I actually find that that premise or that framing really problematic. And it's the same problem I've had with some other books. So this is not a thing that I'm, like this is not a new <laughs> problem for me. I don't know if I, if I knew this, if I would have been as keen to pick up the book, but I don't really love it. Uh, so if you can hear like crazy noises, they're doing construction upstairs above me and I don't know how to get some peace and quiet in this building. But anyway, so what the narrator is doing is she's giving a lot of detail about her great-great-grandfather, her great-grandfather, her great-grandmother, like these, these people in her life um, through a century. And like really specific, intimate details of their thoughts, of their day to day daily actions. 
that she just like couldn't know. Like no matter how much research someone does, no matter how much uh, gathering of information you do, no matter how much talking to someone you do, you couldn't know unless you were in that person's head. Um, Cause you also like, no one could remember that stuff. And a lot of people that she's talking about in her lifetime, are, like her great great grandfather is not, she's never met him. And so like his memory is like twice or three times removed from her. Um, so I find that like the suspension of disbelief between a person who is supposed to be telling like a their own kind of memoir story to someone else but yet also they're saying things they could not possibly know really uh i can never really get on board with that i find it really di kind of disjointed when i'm reading especially because the narrator frequently interjects and says stuff like you'll see brilka or like she'll kind of like <laughs> say like um you know you're like how how could i know this brilka and i really don't like that at all. I find that a, it really breaks the fourth wall, takes you out of the story, and I just, I find that as a reader, not enjoyable. I'm always wary when it's a book in translation to be like, is this like a structural problem or a, or a storytelling problem with the book, or is this just something that's lost or or translated differently in translation. So, you know, there's always that caveat when reviewing a translated book, I feel. There are some really interesting themes explored in here. So again, because we're following over a century of time and there are some really interesting characters, mostly women, we're looking at mostly women in this particular family. The women are, you know, I will say that all the characters are incredibly well developed. They're all distinct from each other. They all have very strong personalities or if they're not strong personalities, they are very, um, well crafted personalities so you know who these people are but i i found that that doesn't matter it didn't make me root for them more it didn't make me care about them more as the story went on the people i was most interested in became less prominent in the story as happens with generational stories like people who get older tend to take up less uh space in the story as people who are, who are younger and closer to the narrative so I found the people, like, the, the closer we got in time to present day, the less I care about the characters. The other thing about this book that I thought, like, really was such a disappointing, like, payoff was I watched an interview with this author where she had said that she wanted to write, um, like, kind of a classic, um, story that had, like, a curse in it, so, like, the, the family that's cursed, um, throughout generations, and the way that she kind of uh, captured that was through this idea of her, the great great grandfather. Um, he owned a, a chocolate or a confectioner's chocolate shop, and he had this recipe for this chocolate, like like black chocolate. That uh, whatever the ingredients were, they were like a magical combination of ingredients, and whoever drank this would be they would be lured by the scent, and they would drink it, but then they would be doomed for the rest of their life. Um, and like so, the, the curse was packaged in this like chocolate thing, which I thought was kind of cool like as a as a concept cool but as it played out in the story i genuinely felt like it was such a throwaway slash tack on piece of the storyline like it didn't matter you could, you could have removed that and it would make no difference because the point is of course like as any kind of long family story is these people all have tragic things happen to them in different ways um some of them are like political related a lot of them are really personal a lot of them from their own decisions a lot of them for externally from outside forces that they have no control over and and it seems like it just keeps happening to this family but I don't think we needed a curse to make that believable because I think that that actually happens like especially in a time of of uh, turmoil and tumult is that a word tumultuous a tumultuous time um with so much upheaval in the Soviet Union especially in this kind of especially post the first world war uh, up until like the late 80s uh there's a there's a lot of change, a lot of instability, a lot of um, need and want, and I also think that what makes some stories about the Soviet Union quite interesting about people who had to make do with out a lot um, is not really in the story because one of the characters is uh, he's very high up in the MVD or whatever uh, I can't remember what it's called, but basically he's like in the working for the KGB slash one of these kind of or government organizations, because um, the name changes a bit throughout the story, so I'm not actually sure where he works, but basically he has a lot of money, and he's high up in the government, and he gets what he needs and what he wants, and it just was like any kind of sense of financial struggle, that or like kind of cultural struggle, 
is kind of absent from this book. There are some peripherally char peripheral characters who struggle with, like, um, struggle, uh, what's the word, ideologically with the Soviet Union um, and with communism. And those characters are, uh, they don't, they don't make a huge impact in the main storyline, but they're also few and far between. And I mean, in some ways I find that interesting because I haven't read a lot of books centered around people who were um, really invested in this Soviet Union, but it also feels like um, we didn't like, it's almost even more interesting to see the kind of the fate befall this, the fates befall this um, well-to-do family minus the curse. Like, I felt the curse was just such a strange <laughs> plot device that was 100% unnecessary in the story. But there's a lot of things that go on in here that are so, such interesting commentary, super compelling nuggets to think and play with, but they're never resolved. So, or they're never really addressed in a way that is satisfying or to, they weren't satisfying to me as a reader. So um, one thing that is, I found, uh, I kind of realized about two thirds of the way in, or maybe even a bit further way in, that every sexual encounter in this book is experienced through trauma. And what I mean by that is um, even if both parties are like into this and they are both um, uh, consenting and willing, they're also, every person is, can, it's like she writes that they are visualizing horrors and traumas that have happened to them as they are uh, intimate with somebody else. And so like this kind of physical intimate act that many people, for many people is like a, an act of connection is also juxtaposed with them re remembering all the awful things they've ever experienced or done or had happened to them. And that is such an interesting um, parallel to have those two things happen to almost every character in this book, especially all the women in this book. And, but to never address it, to never, to never explore that beyond writing it. And I found that um, a huge missed opportunity to do something really interesting with exploring that further. So when I say this book is fine, I should say that it's fine. Uh, I found the first half definitely much more compelling than the last half. There were sections I I enjoyed, of course, way more than other sections, especially toward the end. I found the kind of the section in the middle where the talking, um, kind of the 60s, 70s period uh, to be quite dry, nothing new, nothing interesting there. Um, I had read a, a, a review about this book saying that the author wanted to write a history of Georgia. And I was like, great, I want to read how Georgia, the country of Georgia, experienced the Soviet Union. Um, but this, for, and, and maybe this is because I have read a lot of books about the Soviet Union so that um, I have quite an extensive knowledge about like this period of time of history. Um, so maybe I am different than other readers would be. But it felt like for the first three quarters of this book, it was just a history of Russia or the Soviet Union. It wasn't, it had nothing specific about Georgia. Like the, none of the descriptions of like the cultural or the food, the setting, the landscape, like nothing felt different. Nothing felt, um, I didn't get a sense of place at all from this book until the very end, which is very clearly the author's own personal experiences, her own memories of growing up in Georgia in like the late eighties, just at the turn of uh, the end of communism, um, which I found again, I found that interesting. And then we get a little bit more description of what Georgia is because we then get into like the revolutions and the, and the um, uh, upheaval and the kind of different uh, protests and stuff that happened, uh, Georgia trying to become independent that definitely had way more sense of place there. And I definitely felt more connected to the idea of this separate, these separate people, separate country and like their own um, desire for their independence. But I, there was nothing from the first, you know, 700 pages that made me think that I was reading about Georgia. I just thought I was reading about Russia. And like, maybe that's what Georgia was, but it didn't, I don't know. I just felt like it wasn't what I was expecting, I suppose. And was it bad? No, the writing is totally fine. Um, but that's the thing, it's just fine. So yeah, I just am so disappointed, <laughs> I'm so disappointed. But I just think that if you're gonna make your reader spend 
1,000 pages with you, you have to do better than fine. <laughs> I mean, I would love to hear if you disagree with me about that opinion. Uh, I'd also love to hear if you've read this book, what you thought of it. I've only read positive reviews about this book, and this isn't a negative review. This is a, I wanted this to be better review. This is a, I'm very disappointed review. This is a, why is this book 1,000 pages <laughs> review? I do really think that this book would have been better served as like maybe um, like a, a collection of compendium novels of different characters. So I really felt like the first, you know, third of this book was so good, like really, really compelling. I loved um, Stasia and Christine, the two kind of sisters who are the main driving forces in the first part of the book. Um, they are, their stories are so interesting. Their characters are excellent. I really liked that part of the book and I just felt like, it would be wonderful if <laughs> um, the whole book felt like that. If you, if you really just want to spend a thousand pages with this family who are not likable, but who are compelling, then I would say go ahead and do it. But I also would just say, I just, uh, I feel like, I feel like a child like throwing tantrums, like I wanted it to be better. Last year I read a lot of big books, more so than I had done in previous years and I really started to get along with big books. I really enjoy, um, I enjoy the kind of settling in and like, and spending that extra time with these characters. Um, and I think that's why I was disappointed is that I really felt like I, I didn't want to spend time with these characters toward the end. I just wanted it to be over and that is not a feeling I wanted to have reading uh, a 1000 page. <laughs> book. Um, but I would say that if this sounds interesting to you, like it, then pick it up by all means. Like it's not a bad book. The writing is not terrible. The characters are good. The story is compelling. Um, but I, I will, this will not show up on my best books of 2021 unless my books are all terrible this year. They won't be. If you can hear this noise that's going on, I feel like it's the universe telling me to stop filming. So I'm gonna stop filming. If you have read this book or if you're interested in this book, please let me know in the comments down below. I would love to have a conversation. I've only seen positive reviews. So I would love to see um, any other opinions that people may have about this book. Please share them down below. Um, if you have other recommendations from this author or, or that you think that I would like based on how I felt about this book, please let me know in the comments below. Always happy to hear them. And I will see you guys soon. Bye.